Good morning, everyone. Oh, yeah, this is loud. Great. Um, awesome. Uh, thank you all for being here this morning. Hopefully you've had some coffee, some food. Maybe this isn't even your first session of the morning. Um, I'm Sophia Goldberg. I'm co-founder and CEO of Onsa. I'll do a little bit more about me on the next slide. Um, but welcome to Payments 201. If you're accidentally here, don't worry, I'll catch you up on brief parts of 101 as well. Um, if you're not a payments nerd yet, hopefully you will be in the next hour. Um, a little bit about me, uh, co-founder and CEO of Onsa. We're a white label closed loop as a service payments platform, which is a lot of words to mean we help merchants embed customer balances. Um, this drives revenue, reduces fees, increases loyalty. I will not be speaking more about Onsa today, um, but about all things payments. I also wrote a book that some of you may have heard of or read called The Field Guide to Global Payments, um, which is you know the book I wished I had when I started in payments a few years ago. Gonna briefly talk you through the areas I'm gonna cover today. So first is Payments 101. It's gonna be brief, but gets everyone on the same page. Uh, then cards for experts, so some things like routing and cross-border acquiring, um, and then non-card taxonomy, which if you've read my book, you might be familiar with at certain levels, but I think it's really important to go into understanding non-card ways to pay globally um, and what that nitty-gritty kind of looks like a little more. So to start, let's all get on the same page. To go beyond the four-party model, we must all understand the four-party model. Um, and so most of you hopefully have some payments knowledge or experience. I'm not gonna go through kind of the flow of a transaction, which I think is more common knowledge at this point. Um, but I will talk about the four-party model, the role of the networks, and then uh, something near and dear to my heart, which hopefully someone does an entire session on uh, at some point of flavors of PSP. Payment service provider means many, many things. Um, and I'm gonna break down kind of some of the different types and roles briefly. So the four-party model, just to give a recap, is who is involved in a card transaction. So there's the buyer and the seller, so the merchant selling goods and services, uh, the cardholder, the customer purchasing the goods and services. This can be a business, this can be a consumer. Then you have the acquirer, which is the merchant's bank. Uh, they're a licensed member of the card networks, they're part of the authorization flow, they move the money, um, and then the issuing bank who's the representative of the cardholder, they issue the card. And so the easiest way I think about this is each buyer or seller has a bank agent um, that works on their behalf to solve this coordination issue, I call it. Um, but you'll notice the four-party model is missing quite a well-known character in payments, which is the networks. And so they are not considered part of this four-party model, sometimes it's called the five-party model. Um, and I think that's because they are kind of what underlies this entire system. And I like to talk about the role of the networks as solving the coordination issue. Um, so I created this diagram that's also in my book because I used to, when training new hires, would talk about the, the coordination issue in the funnel, and I'd use cat whiskers, which like doesn't really look good in a book, and so I turned it on its side to make it more look like an hourglass. But this idea that you connect billions of consumers or cardholders and millions of merchants, how does everyone talk? Uh, how do you send money securely? How do you build trust? How do you speak the same language, especially when you're not speaking literally the same language in you know, the aspects of global commerce? And so the networks really solve this coordination issue by deciding a lot of the rules, the way of talking, our language and payments is ISO 8583, and so that's what we speak to be able to talk amongst ourselves. Um, and also, you know, if there's fraud, who do you call? Who protects everyone in the ecosystem? And so I know sometimes you know, we like to rag on the networks a little bit, but it's pretty phenomenal, the coordination effort um, and issues they're able to overcome and help us with. Uh, next is flavors of PSP. Like I said, this is gonna be tip of the iceberg, um, but I think we use PSP, payment service provider, really interchangeably. Um, we also use the word acquirer really interchangeably. Um, and so I like to break it down into four, though this is always changing, because the fun thing about payments is there's always different business models and way of helping merchants and, and consumers or cardholders pay. Um, so the first is a gateway. Uh, I think of this as this is the technical connection. By the way, there are some companies which are multiple of these, which gets more confusing. Um, so Gateway connects a merchant or brand to one or more acquirers. They might connect to one, you might connect to many, like a Spreedly type situation. Um, next is the acquirer. So some acquirers can be a bank with payments. Uh, some can be a PSP with a bin acquirer. Some can be a gateway that got a bin uh, sponsor to be able to acquire payments, and then moved and also got a banking license like an Adyen. 
Uh, the next is a payment facilitator. I think of this as one of, there's a few different flavors of reseller models in payments. Um, but this, typically Payfax, payments is one of many services they offer to a merchant. So payment facilitators, especially for, say, verticalized platforms, which has been a very growing business model in the previous few years. Um, it speeds up time to market. I think one you know, thing as, as payments professionals and payments nerds, we want everyone to understand what happens. But for most merchants, their need to understand payments is very narrow. And if we all do our job right, they understand enough, but let us deal with the complexity. Um, and then the next is orchestrator, which is a, a newer terminology, but I kind of dumb it down to gateway plus. And so this is, you're not just the API connection to different acquirers and payment providers. You're doing a little bit of extra work like, uh, you know, reporting or optimization or routing or risk management. We're gonna talk more about routing and, you know, some field nuances a little bit later as well. So you think you know card payments. Now we're gonna get into some of the more 201 type topics. Um, and so gonna talk a little bit about merchant category codes as well as routing. So you have a lot of options on how you send a message, where you send a message, everything like that. So this is the slide to see if you're all awake. Uh, this is like putting ATM machines and saying that. Hopefully merchant category codes, codes, is annoying to some of you, so this is the test there. Um, and so these are the four digit codes that allow the network and issuing bank to understand what type of good or service is being sold. So this is super important to get right for a lot of reasons. Um, it's key for authorization rates, it changes what fees are, it changes risk levels. Um, some merchants have wiggle room, which I'll talk about in a minute. Some don't, so some merchants like American Airlines have their own MCC, which is a story for another day, um, but I always think that's pretty cool. And so a few ways this code is important or valuable. Um, it helps everyone who's trying to you know, coordinate across the line of a payment understand what's being sold. Is this shoes? Is this a dating app subscription? Is this you know, oil and gas? Is this you know, something else in between? So that helps the issuing bank decide what fees come along with this transaction, uh, what risk level, so there's high risk MCCs, how would you classify a dating app? This is one of my favorites. It uses the escort MCC, uh, which the dating apps in the past you know, five to 10 years are not super happy with being lumped in with escort services. But also, you know, dating app subscriptions aren't as low risk as a Netflix subscription. A lot more people are gonna be unhappy, file chargebacks. And so it's an interesting push me pull you that as you know, commerce models change really quickly, it takes a little bit of time for the networks and everyone in payments to figure out how do we classify this? What is the risk? How should we bill for this? Things like that. Um, but that risk level helps, for example, the issuing bank understand how should I look at the level of risk when I'm authorizing this transaction? Um, and then approval logic is also a part of this. So some cards are restricted to certain MCCs. Um, one example of this is in Brazil, a lot of employers give their, uh, their employees a card for funds for lunch. And that'll be restricted to say grocery stores, convenience stores, mini marts, restaurants. Um, and there have been questions in the past of should a convenience store MCC be included? Because you can also buy like cigarettes and candy, which isn't exactly lunch, which is the purpose of this card. And then it gets into all kinds of fun stuff because you could also buy a sandwich there. Um, and so MCC codes are also have to be large enough to catch a lot of business types but also then you get into the minutia of it not really fitting everything. Um, and so that also means some merchants might be able to fit a few. And so um, that can be like a large marketplace that has streaming services and sells physical goods and maybe sells you know, API services as well. They could decide, as you're, if you're a larger merchant and have some you know, data science teams and ability to build routing logic, which I think is you know, the 201 topics we're here to talk about today, that you can split your own volume as a merchant across different MCC codes to optimize for you know, the right MCC code for the right goods and services, which also helps you optimize for things like fees and things like that. Um, <clears throat> there are also some merchants who might have multiple MCC codes that could apply and you know, pass you know, regulatory muster from the networks that yeah, both of these fit. Um, and so some merchants will run A-B tests and there's supposed to be a moment in time, not kind of a forever playing around, but they might decide to optimize for authorization rates or they might wanna optimize for fees. Some MCCs are higher fixed fees or lower fixed fees. Depending on your AOV, that might be very different to your unit economics and your bottom line. And so being able to decide with your acquirer um, or acquirers can do this with and proactively with merchants and large customers, um, you can see kind of what makes the most sense 
for our business, what makes the most sense, um, and play around with things. Uh, another aspect of that minutia I like to call lost in translation. Um, I like to you know, go back to the coordination issue. We, there are a ton of issuers globally. And so you have more control over a payment message than you might think. I think there's almost 200 data elements in an ISO message now. I'm sure someone in this room probably knows like the specific that it is today. Um, but we use the word authorization because you're asking the cardholder's issuing bank to approve the transaction. So you're asking per permission, did you say please? And this is a bit, you know, tongue in cheek, but it really gets down to almost cultural nuances on the, on the technical level of, you know, someone might wanna hear please, someone might wanna say pretty please, but when you get down to the nitty gritty, at the field level, there are nuances that feel that arbitrary. Um, and little, uh, little changes to the format of your message can make a really big difference. So I'm gonna talk about two specifically that I think illustrate this really well. Um, and again, there are, you know, with hundreds of fields, there are thousands of little tweaks you can try and A-B test and build bin-based logic and really go like deep, deep, deep on how you optimize for that extra bit of authorization, which if you're processing billions in volume can be meaningful. Uh, the first is zero dollar uh, authorizations or validations. So if you're a uh, merchant doing subscriptions where you wanna offer a free trial, you'll wanna validate a card maybe before you save it to make sure someone's not just goofing you know, and putting a, a stolen card or a fake card. Um, historically, merchants would send a $1 charge and either cancel it or let it expire, but that means the consumer sees that $1 pop up. Not everyone understands. Many people actually don't understand that that $1 charge isn't actually a charge yet. So then there's customer service complaints, it's confusing. Some merchants won't cancel it, so then for a week you have a dollar tied up, um, and again, from a customer experience perspective, that might be the make or break for some other purchase to then fall into insufficient funds. And so there's been a big push over the last years um, to drive validation calls to looking like validation calls with a zero dollar authorization or zero dollar validation. Um, sometimes there's an additional fee that goes along with that, but that helps everybody understand, in the same way MCC code tells us what's being sold, the zero dollar authorization tells us what's happening here. What is the reason for this transaction? And while that's nice, when you have you know, hundreds and thousands of issuers globally, not everyone does this correctly. And so some still prefer one dollar. Uh, some will authorize both. Um, and so it's really important, especially at scale, if you're doing any meaningful amount of validations, to be able to dynamically change what you're validating against. Um, and this also changes, right? It takes time for folks to adopt and change their technology. Uh, there's different priorities, right? What's a priority for one issuing bank to update their approval logic isn't maybe for another in the same time. Um, so all of these things are kind of constantly living and breathing, and so you can't just do set and forget, especially on something like this. Uh, the second is CVV on MIT, Merchant Initiated Transactions. Um, I decided not today to go deep into the MIT CIT framework, which is a, a different, interesting, fun bit. Um, but if I'm the first to tell you, then your PCI regulator or auditor will thank me someday, you are not allowed to store CVV. And so there is no time when, if there's a merchant-initiated transaction, which means um, that could be a recurring transaction or something where there's a stored card credential and the merchant creates that transaction onto the card, where there should be a CVV sent. Because if a merchant's not allowed to store that, how are they allowed to send it? So that's all you know, logical and to code. However, some issuing banks still wanna see the field or wanna see the field with certain values in it because you know, they may not have implemented the CIT MIT framework perfectly, right? Your customers don't all implement your APIs perfectly. So you know, if, if you've seen you know, update books from the networks, it's a lot to get through, it's a lot to roadmap, it's a lot to prioritize, and so things fall through the cracks. Um, and this is one of those that I've seen throughout my career as an interesting point of playing with, do you drop the field or not? Do you add it back? Um, and again, none of this can be hard-coded because issuing banks are living and breathing um, and changing technology like any, any company. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about routing logic. Um, so I'm gonna talk about you know, routing over different network rails as well as through different acquiring countries. So I think this is especially important in this day and age where you know, no merchant really sells in just the country they're located in. 
But first I'll talk about dual branded cards. Um, so many cards globally have multiple brands on them. So we have you know, the global cards like Visa, MasterCard, Amex, um, but many have local networks as well. So like Troy in Turkey, Bank Contact in Belgium, Carte Bancaire in France. And these are local networks that decide to dual brand either to be used internationally or uh, you know, the global brands becoming more prevalent locally. Um, you, we may all know and love the pin debit networks or when they're used online, sometimes we say the pinless debit networks, which is supremely confusing, um, which I'll talk about more in a minute, but I like to describe these to people as if you're at an ATM and you look at the little sticker, all of those are the unaffiliated networks that we have in the US. Um, but this means that then if a card has multiple brands, you don't have to just send it down the main rail. You have multiple options of where you can send that payment. And that can affect authorization rates that in the US example can hugely affect interchange fees. And so the ability to decide in real time where do I wanna send this message is really important. Um, and I think this is a really strong thing for acquirers to be able to offer is to build out that logic and help merchants understand that you don't just have to offer Visa MasterCard, you can, we can connect you to these other rails, have more kind of shots on goal to get that authorization. So in, in the US, like I said, these are the, the debit networks. Um, and thanks to the Durban Amendment and Reg 2, all debit cards in the US are multi-branded. Um, and it, it means that you know, at the point of sale for years, 12 years, I guess, there has to be the ability to route the transaction and get an approval on either. So the issuing bank has to be able to accept you know, kind of the authorization coming from any of the rails that that card is connected to. Um, as of July 1 of this year, which is super exciting, this is now expanded into CNP or card not present, so online transactions. And so uh, some large merchants and some large acquirers for years have been able to allow authorizations over the, the pin debit networks online, but now the issuing banks have to be able to support it. And so this is gonna be kind of open season for things like least cost routing. Um, not surprisingly, community banks are pretty worried about this for two main reasons. There's, I think, open questions around what does this do for fraud levels? You know, there's more trust that a visa knows how to build out robust, you know, fraud and monitoring compared to, you know, I don't want to call out any debit network specifically because I don't know who's in the room, um, but to a smaller network that just has fewer resources, maybe not as recent technology, um, newer to online transaction approvals. But the other side, which I think is, you know, probably the real problem is they could be, you know, losing half of their interchange revenue. And so with lower revenue, potentially higher fraud, it makes sense that community banks who are issuing card, debit cards aren't super excited about you know, this online use case, which already has higher fraud than in-store payments. Um, and, and so now kind of the, the question from here is what are acquirers and merchants gonna do? Are we gonna see a broader adoption of least cost routing? Is this gonna stay a payments 201 or payments PhD topic that only the largest you know, merchants with very sophisticated modern acquirers are doing? Um, there's some very large merchants in the US that have direct connections, which is amazing. Um, and so I think there's, it's gonna be an evolving thing in the coming years of how this gets adopted and used. The next is acquiring country, which will kind of 4AS into the non-card methods, but for local card acquiring, a merchant must have a local entity per scheme rules. And so if you wanna you know, accept Brazilian REI in Brazil, take money in the country beyond a local acquirer, you need a local entity. Um, that's true of any country where the card networks are. However, most merchants don't have a need for multiple global entities. I don't know if there's any merchant that has an entity in every country that they have customers. Um, and so there's a lot of ways around this. Um, one of them is called cross-border acquiring. And so that's deciding, you know, maybe my home country as a, as a company, I have an entity in the US, I have customers in Brazil and Europe. Uh, I'm gonna do US acquiring cross-border. I can still do local presentment of the currency, uh, but then I'm getting, you know, my currency back in the US things like that. Um, so it really allows to utilize. As you grow, you might wanna add on different entities or you might wanna choose, and this is more like an expert level, if you have multiple entities, which one do you do cross-border acquiring from? So if you have a US entity and a European entity, maybe you use your European entity for rest of world because you might be able to benefit from uh, you know, interchange caps. The inverse of that, then maybe you have you know, more 3DS burden than if you did US entity into Europe. Um, but I think there's lots of considerations that I just wanted to talk through at a high level 
um, which is, you know, there's currency implications if you're doing cross-border acquiring. Um, what currency do you want to receive funds in from your acquirer? If you're mainly in the US and you don't want to deal with, you know, your own Forex team and you have no OPEX in Thai bot, you have no reason when you're doing cross-border acquiring into Thailand to receive that currency. But maybe you're slightly bigger and you think, you know, your treasury management team can get a better rate, you'll take like for like settlement, things like that. Uh, another consideration is in many countries, and there's an asterisk because this one's always changing, you might have higher decline rates, right? And so if the issuer's the one authorizing a transaction, they see, you know, why is my Thai card holder in Thai bot getting, you know, an American company I've never heard of with an American acquirer I maybe haven't heard of, this looks a little fishy. And so you might, you know, en masse have lower uh, authorization rates, and so that's something to think about. But, you know, that might level up because it opens up an entire new, new market for you. The other is authentication requirements. So, right, if you're local only in one country or a few countries, you might not know what the payment norms are in other countries, like needing 3DS on debit card transactions on, in Brazil, or how to work with 3DS2 in Europe when or if it applies for cross-border acquiring transactions. And, and then there's the other question of maybe it doesn't apply, but the consumer locally will expect it. And so how do you play kind of those two off of each other? Um, and then fees is an interesting one uh, because sometimes cross-border acquiring is more expensive. Um, sometimes it's a little cheaper. I think historically Japan, local acquiring was more expensive. That may have changed in the last few years. I've been a little distant from Japanese acquiring for a few years. Um, but your end consumer may also face fees from their bank. I've seen this in Turkey uh, where we did cross-border acquiring uh, out of a European entity and in Turkish lira and they got hit by a, you know, a charge from their bank, which it's like it's local presentment. Yes, it's cross-border, kind of yes, literally yes, but, you know, uh, and, and it gets interesting because then, you know, there's customer service complaints and how do you deal with that? And so there's all these other kind of flywheel effects of cross-border acquiring. Um, and then local taxes and regulations. So especially if you're taking local currency, can you get that currency out of the country? Do you have a need for that currency? Are there other, you know, local taxes you might have to pay? So let's ditch cards and move on. I think we're all gonna talk about cards a lot this week. Um, how else do payments move? Um, so a lot of these are gonna be what I call the non-card taxonomy. So a lot of payment methods globally are kind of facsimiles of each other. And so if you understand at the macro a few flavors, you'll be able to quickly spot like, oh, OXO, that's in Mexico, that looks a lot like Conveni in Japan. And you can think about how do funds flow, how do authorizations work, how should I deal with this payment method? Um, and you know, there's a lot that's new in payments, but there's a lot that we've figured out and we can repeat because it's known and it works. So first I'll talk about bank-based. I will not give this the time it deserves, also because I know other folks this week are talking about things like RTP and FedNow. Um, but bank-based payments, we can call it you know, ACH in the US, a to A uh, or account to account is often how we talk about it right now. Uh, it can be direct debit, RTP, which, uh, you know, RTP is real-time payments. There are also real-time payments networks or systems called RTP, like in the US. We decided to make it a little confusing for ourselves. Um, there are many ways to pay with a bank globally. And so the key concept here is push versus pull. So who's the active party? Um, this is really important, especially when you think about e-commerce transactions or recurring transactions. Um, and so examples, so UPI in India and PIX in Brazil are very famous examples in the last years of hyper successful RTP systems. Um, direct debit, like SEPA in Europe. And so this is, you know, permission to pull. And so this is a bank account holder giving permission for an entity to pull funds. Um, in the US, checks are permission to pull. Um, aside, it's my favorite payment method, I can get into that after if anyone's curious why. Um, and then the next is bank transfers. So Ideal in the Netherlands or ACH in the US or BAX in the UK, asterisk, some of these also support direct debit, so it's not perfect. Um, but I think when we think about what's the future of things like RTP, which I'll talk about in a second briefly, um, the way I think we can learn a lot in the US of how to support recurring transactions with how they've solved this in uh, regions like Europe. And so for example, in the Netherlands, if you set up you know, a subscription, you might do that at first transaction over ideal, where you go into your banking app, you authorize and push the payment, but then you also agree for SEPA as the recurring debit. And so this allows what is a push method to become a pull method 
for future subscriptions, which can be you know, a little risky because you might hit NSF and things like that, but from a customer experience, it allows them to have recurring where they might not have a credit or debit card or aren't used to using a credit or debit card. Um, next, I'll talk very briefly about US real-time payments. We can't say US RTP, because US RTP is specifically RTP by the clearinghouse, but we have two RTP systems now, and big excitement for, for FedNow, which is live, which is operated by the Fed. Um, we are early days of real-time payments in the US, but it feels like it's finally our turn for some of these systems, which will unlock a lot on B2B payment side, um, and I think there will be a lot of folks who are here this week working on how do we work with both of these systems? How do we help our customers work with these systems? How do we decide which system to use. There's different limits, slightly different use cases. Um, I think we're very early innings of what this looks like. So RTP in the US doesn't have full coverage. I think about 62, 66% of DDAs in the US are accessible by RTP. Fed now is all banks with a you know, Fed master account, things like that. So early innings, and I think in true American fashion, we have a patchwork of issuing banks, which means we have to tweak things on routing to get things right. I think there will also be some of that with real-time payments as well. Next, I'm gonna talk about delayed payment. Um, and so I think th the questions for a delayed payment when you're thinking about offering delayed payments to, as a merchant to a consumer or a platform to merchants um, or building delayed payments is, the questions are, when does the seller get paid in full? And when does the customer get their goods or services? And I break this down into three areas, installments, open invoice, and buy now, pay later. Um, and the curious part is Klarna started as open invoice and then became buy now, pay later. So nothing is you know, a forever decision in this industry. So first is installments. So this is like layaway or you know, card payments in Brazil, you're able to do installments where your card will continue to charge you and owns the, the uh, issuing bank owns that logic. Um, and the merchant also then is cleared funds over time. Um, uh, the next is open invoice. So you can think of this as a delayed payment to the merchant, but the customer gets their goods now. And so this really started as a try before you buy, um, especially in Europe where there's not a normative use of credit cards or even debit cards online or you know, large credit facilities. Um, and so you know, with the rise of e-commerce, folks wanna buy 10 pairs of pants, maybe keep two, you don't wanna actually pay up front for 10. And so 63% of online transactions in Germany are actually this idea of open invoice, um, where a few weeks later you'll be billed, which gives you time to send goods back, then they don't have to deal with a refund, everything like that over uh, bank rails. And the final one is buy now, pay later, which I think we're all probably quite familiar with over the past few years. Um, but this is often, though not always, administered by a third party payment provider, which means everyone wins in a way. Um, because the customer gets their funds or their goods now, the merchant gets their funds now. Um, the uh, you know the risk and a lot of that is taken on by the buy now pay later provider, um, which can be you know interesting uh, if you're trying to you know increase cart conversion things like that. The next I want to talk through is wallets, um, and I, I like asking is wallet the least specific term in payments or just generally, right? Wallet can mean many things. Um, some wallets are, you know, all parts of this taxonomy I'll go through, um, but you can think of, you know, Apple Pay is a wallet. Uh, you know, storing your ID card or loyalty card feels like a wallet. Um, PayPal, Venmo, Alipay, there's many types of wallets, but saying the word wallet doesn't actually tell us anything about what that payment method does. And so I really like to talk about it as, you know, how do funds or data move? And so that's passed, uh, passed through versus staged. And then where can those funds or payment credentials be used? So that's closed loop versus open loop. Um, so first, pass through versus staged. So a pass-through wallet you can think about like the wallet in your pocket, right? It stores credentials securely and on your behalf can share those credentials um, on your behalf. So that's you know Apple Pay, Google Pay, where you tokenize your card with a network token, which I also didn't have time to go deep on today, but it's a very fun topic um, and very exciting for the payment industry. And, or Alipay you know, sometimes has also stored credentials. Um, staged more means the funds are staged. So rather than sharing the credentials for that other party to charge you, they're sharing the funds on your behalf. Um, so this is you know, like Venmo, though they also can link your bank account to do that direct stage or pass through. So again, lines are constantly bl blurred in wallet world. Or say Gojek in Indonesia where you top up with cash for the ability to use those funds online. Um, and some and many are both, right? Like a PayPal or even in some scenarios of Venmo where you have both cash and card or bank account linked and things like that. So it's not perfect.
Um, open loop versus closed loop. This is near and dear to my heart. I build closed loop infrastructure. Um, but open loop and closed loop for wallets is a little different than when we talk networks, right? Like American Express, we talk about being a closed loop network, but those funds can be spent anywhere. So it's not true closed loop in the sense we're talking about with wallets. But open loop wallets can be used anywhere that the wallet's accepted. So like Cash App or Cash App Pay. You can use it on Square Terminals, you can use it on some websites accept it. Um, same with you know, Venmo as a broader payment method, not just to send money to friends. Um, but closed loop can only be spent where you have those funds or the credentials. So that's the Starbucks balance, that's your uh, Metro card, that's things like that. Um, maybe virtual currencies in a, a mobile game, right, are a closed loop uh, payment experience. The, the final one I'll talk about is cash and ATM. Um, I think especially for online transactions, we forget that cash and ATM are a very valid way to pay, even for a digital transaction. Uh, I was at Adyen for a few years. One of our favorite kind of gotchas in new hire onboarding was asking what kind of payment do we not accept? People will go, cash, and we go, we accept cash, this is how, we just don't accept checks. They didn't at the time. Um, and so we all know cash and ATMs work very well in the physical world, it's immediate, it's, we say it, you know, is par value, it's about 70 bips is the cost of cash to a merchant when you sum it all up, um, but how is it relevant for digital? And so you think about this also in a lot of countries that either cards aren't normative and there's large populations that don't have access to bank accounts or the banks don't have online ways to pay. And so there's kind of, two ways to think about this. There's either cash on delivery um, or cash to complete is one way to call it. Um, and it's over 3% of global online transactions. So it's a huge piece of the payments pie is this idea of using um, cash or your ATM to complete a transaction. Um, so it's important, especially from a merchant perspective or an acquirer perspective, that these are asynchronous payment methods. Uh, you create something like you can call it an offer. So you open an offer on behalf of a customer and they have a certain amount of time to kind of pay for that either, you know, if it's Convini in Japan or Oxfam in Mexico, at a convenience store that participates. Um, Boleto in Brazil, you can use your app, you can go into a convenience store. Um, in Indonesia, you can go to an ATM, type in the code, which is, you know, called a virtual account and complete that order. Um, and so something really important here then to think about is how long do you leave that offer open? You know, if you're Spotify or Netflix, there's no opportunity cost in letting that sit open for a week, right? It's, you know, minuscule to, to let that person's account run for a few extra days. If you're selling a TV online and you're setting that aside in a warehouse, you probably don't wanna set that aside more than one or two days, if that, because that means someone else can't buy that. Um, and so these are all decisions that come into if you're accepting cash or ATM or these asynchronous in real world offer type payment methods to think about. Um, and then of course there's the cultural nuance. So different countries have very different kind of conversion rates. So Japan, for example, is a very high conversion rate for Konbini because when someone decides I'm gonna pay for this, culturally, there's a very high likelihood that they will actually go pay for that. They feel like it's more of a commitment to pay. There's other countries where it's more of a lackadaisical, like, oh, this is convenient. If I walk by the convenience store and I haven't bought something else that day, maybe I'll close that offer. And so it can be, you know, 20, 30, 40% conversion rate. And so you don't want that TV sitting around in your warehouse for two weeks. Um, so, I, I know I wanted to leave about 10 minutes for questions, which I have. Um, so I covered a lot of wide ranging topics at various levels of depth. Um, so wanted to open up uh, the room for questions. Yeah, so in, in some ways it's different than layaway uh, because there's a third party administering it. Um, and also, depending on the time. So, I, well, at least when I think of layaway, I think of it as, you know, Sears and you're buying a washing machine and you have, you know, weeks or months to pay for it. Um, these are very, like, short moment in time. And so this, rather than a budgeting tool, is much more of a uh, access to, you know, online payment method tool. But from, like, a physical goods perspective, a merchant should, you know, not lay away that product for too long, given that. Yeah. Why is checks my favorite payment method? Yeah, um, I really like checks. They're like a very American nuance. I've lived in other countries and people look at me like a, we're crazy here for using checks. Um, they clear at par value. I think the history of check 21 with 9-11 is super neat and cool about how checks almost tanked the American economy. Read my book if you want a more deep dive on that. Um, and, but for me, it's the fastest way for me to transfer money between my own accounts at different banks. And so I have many friends that have started doing this after I talk about it, but I have checkbooks for my different bank accounts, and then I can do mobile deposit, and within 30 seconds, I've transferred funds between my own bank accounts at different banks, and it is so much easier. <laughs>
<laughs> and it's bonkers and a failure of the system, but it's very easy. Yeah, so par value means a lot of, say, like card payments or other payments um, net settle, meaning if it's a $10 transaction but there's $1.50 in fees, you get eight bucks 50. Whereas if I send you a $70 check, you get $70. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, uh, can you say more on the question there? Mm. Yeah, cool. So repeating for those who are watching the future at home. Um, so the question was around kind of emerging payment methods and like A to A, open banking, UPI. Um, so there is a lot of changes happening. Um, and what I like to call out is in a lot of countries outside the US, a lot of it is driven at a national level with regulation that goes in hand with things like identity protocols and things like that. Um, I think we will need similar pushes at a more macro level in the US to get like a UPI or PIX level RTP system. Um, but I think A to A is one we're seeing a lot come up in the US. Um, we're still in early days of a consumer linking their bank account for any sort of everyday transaction. But there's a lot of companies working towards that, especially if it's a higher ticket size, it makes a lot more sense um, either with innovations on ACH and being able to see, you know, transaction history, current account balance to de-risk an ACH transaction, or, you know, with RTP Fed now as nascent um, payment methods, it's becoming more of an option for everyday use cases of payments to run over bank rails as well. So I'm really excited to see what happens there in the U.S. Um, open banking in the, US, in the U.K. is really interesting. Um, for those who don't know, uh, the U.K., and again, this comes down to more regulation, said banks have to open their APIs. And so it's the ability for both fintechs to compete, but also from a user perspective that, you know, the access to your information, you're not locked into your bank. Um, and so I think it's really interesting uh, when you think about how data can flow and access to that data, right? Having to have APIs to access that data. Um, so I'm, I'm, yeah, curious to see what happens in the U.S., but I think, like I talked about in the coordination issue um, concept, we have a lot of banks and issuing banks in the US. Um, so anything like that, I think, will also take a lot of time. Yeah, great question. Um, I think my perspective of all of this is while the global economy and the US economy is expanding, like there's enough pie for everyone. Um, and so I think it, I think about it less as Fed now coming in and taking some of Visa's lunch, which is a very large pie, um, and they probably won't miss a chunk of it for a while, um, to, to the effect of everything's growing. But I, I think of it more in, in what we're building at Onsa as a move towards the right payment method for the right use case. And so I think figuring out with you know, Fed limits and, and things like that, Fed now limits, uh, you know, for larger B2B transactions, it can make sense. For more you know, AR, AP examples, it can make a lot more sense. Um, we'll see if you know, there become interesting consumer uh, iterations of it that make sense. Um, but for me, I think of it less as like we're all fighting each other for parts of the pie. I think it's more like let's have a cherry pie over here and an apple pie over here and let merchants decide what is the correct commerce enablement for their use case. How updated is my book? Uh, June 2022. So there's a whole chapter on crypto. <laughs> um, but there's not a lot about FedNow or like US RTP. Um, so there's some stuff that's out of date. There's some areas that I know I'll have to do a second edition, like adding more around robustness around issuing um, and credit. But if you want that information today, go to Preeti's talk from Lithic. Um, yeah, so it's, it's quite up to date. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so the, the MCC is decided by, I'm pretty sure it's the, the underwriting team at the acquiring bank, um, though they're in close connection with the card networks, and so if something's borderline, it's usually best to check in um, and make sure, because no one really wants to do the wrong thing on purpose. Well, some people do, but that's a different issue. <laughs> um, most of us, let's say, want to be, you know, 98% kosher most of the time. Um, and so from, from that perspective, 
uh, like a merchant can't just willy-nilly change it. You need a, a new mid with the new MCC, which then the, you know, the networks see because you create the mid per network, um, the merchant ID, which is kind of, I think about it as like your lane on the network rail for your transaction. If we're gonna use like road analogies. Hopefully not, um, just kidding. Um, so the question was uh, for people who don't have bank account access, do they use crypto wallets instead? Um, so this is an interesting one. Um, a lot of Americans don't have bank accounts, um, like read plan or listen to Planet Money episodes on postal banking and the many you know, dreams of, of that in the US. Um, so I think there's a, a few different iterations people have. So there's um, you know, uh, carrier billing in some African nations where you know your you can bill to your uh, phone number or your you know telecom provider, um, and so there's different things like that because I think there's much more internet access than there are bank account access in the world, which is like a very exciting place to be in the world of payments. Um, so I think some folks it is crypto. Um, I think we still have a long way to go on like accessibility and understandability of that for like day to day normative use cases, but yeah. Do a sure. Yeah, so I, I, I think part of it is, you know, we're a little out of the, the crypto heyday. We're in a bit of a winter right now. Um, I'm a crypto nerd, but I don't think it's, you know, payments is the most interesting use case for crypto, but we can get into that another time. Um, I, think, I think some of it is volatility. I think some of it is um, a lot of what crypto says it solves for payments doesn't have to actually be blockchain. Um, a in-house immutable ledger can do a lot um, and, and things like that. Oh, so the question is, uh, with my payments crystal ball, what I think the most exciting use cases for FedNow will be. Um, I mean, the one I would like it to be is like rent payments. I Venmo my landlord, uh, which is crazy. Um, and it's, and some people have like much worse systems. So I think like hopefully those larger, not every day, but you know, normative consumer purchases, I think those are some of the, the first ones that'll be interesting, maybe escrow and home buying as well, uh, things like that. Yeah, so the question is, do I think RTP and FedNow will stay separate or kind of integrate a little more? Um, that one, I don't know. Um, I think there's probably other people that have much better senses and, and knowledge than me on it. Um, I would hope, because I think having two separate systems in the US feels a little silly. I think it comes down to the question of, you know, what happens at the regulatory level, which is what, you know, PICS and UPI being unified systems and like national RTP rails has done. Uh, but I'm not sure. I assume there will need to be some interoperability, but uh, I'm not sure. And we are perfectly at time. So thank you so much for coming. Hopefully you learned something new. Um, thank you.